Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Zara Brownless. I am a researcher and a cognitive scientist here at Google. So I'm particularly thrilled to today be introducing you to a particularly illustrious fellow scientist. Not only are they the author of the recently published Little Book of Exoplanets, but Joshua Wynn is Professor of Astrophysical Sciences at Princeton University and also just happens to be co-investigator on an ongoing NASA mission that, as we speak, is searching for planets orbiting the brightest stars in our sky. Now, luckily for us, Josh himself is a bit closer to home. He's currently going to be joining us from New Jersey in Princeton, um, not so far away from where I am currently based in Manhattan at Google's offices here. And also luckily for us, we are going to be getting a personal half hour tour through the fascinating and quite frankly, surprising science of exoplanets from quite literally the man who wrote the book. Uh, so we're gonna have a 15 minute discussion after Josh finishes his half an hour walkthrough, uh, but I'm so excited to hear everything he has to teach us. Josh, I'm so grateful you're here with us. Over to you. Thank you so much, Zara. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. I, I always find it inspiring when people spend their precious free time learning, just uh, expressing their curiosity. And I'm going to try to make it uh, worth your while. I'm going to show you uh, our little corner of the universe where we study exoplanets. So first things first, what is an exoplanet? Well, I'm sure at some point in your life you have been thinking about exoplanets, even if you hadn't used that term, because Again, at some point, you were outside on a clear, dark night, looking up at all these stars, and you started wondering. You know that each of these points of light is some distant star, just as hot and luminous as our sun. And you wondered, do any of those stars have planets circling around them? Are there other solar systems that resemble ours? Are there any creatures on those planets looking back at me, wondering the same thing? So. In those states of mind, you've been thinking about exoplanets. An exoplanet is a planet, but it orbits another star, not the sun, well outside our solar system. Even the nearest exoplanets are light years away. It's a very new, rapidly advancing field of astronomy, one of the most exciting areas in astronomy, driven by new technological developments. At this point, we have about 5,500 exoplanets that we know of. On the other hand, it's a very old field in the sense that people have been wondering about this for centuries. It's one of the most long anticipated discoveries in science was the discovery of worlds around other stars. It's hard to think of any other scientific advance that has such a long prehistory. What has also helped is that we have science fiction that feeds our imagination and conditioned us to, to imagine what, the condition, what, the, what it might be like on other worlds. So especially good for this is Star Wars. Think of Luke Skywalker looking across the desert landscape at uh, two setting suns in the sky. Or in a later film uh, where Luke, where, uh, Ben Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker have their epic lightsaber duel on a planet that's covered with oceans of lava. So we have a lot of things to think about from science fiction. And part of what I'm here to tell you today is that we have discovered some worlds that share these key characteristics that do have two stars in the sky that probably are covered with oceans of lava. So part of the fun of this field is also watching the boundary between science and science fiction move and advance. So I wanna tell you some of those new discoveries and how we know. How do we know anything about worlds that are so far away? So, but before we get carried away with exoplanets, let's just remind ourselves about the planets of the solar system. Because for centuries, those were the only planets we knew about and they helped to set everybody's expectations about what exoplanets would be like. So here are the planets of the solar system, and they come in different groups. So there are four small planets that are mostly solid, made of rock and metal. That's uh, Mercury, Mars, Venus, and the Earth. Then we have four much larger planets that, in addition to having some of solid material, have large amounts of hydrogen and helium gas. 
So there's uh, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter. Now, if we zoom way out and could somehow look down on the solar system from above, we would notice two other interesting things. First of all, the orbits of all the planets around the sun are very nearly circles. Officially, they are ellipses. They're not quite circular, but they're awfully close to being circular. And if we look at the solar system from the side, we also notice, in addition to being circular, the orbits are nearly aligned with each other. The solar system is flat, with all of the orbits sharing roughly the same orientation. Now, what's interesting about this is that there's no law of physics that says orbits have to be nearly circular and aligned with each other. Mathematically, it is perfectly plausible to construct a solar system with highly eccentric elliptical orbits that are tilted at large angles with respect to each other. So the fact that the actual solar system has these symmetries that with circular orbits and aligned orbits seems to be telling us something about planet formation, about the initial conditions from which the planets sprung. Now, the other uh, pattern, this one took longer to realize, is that the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, are all near the sun, and the gas giants are all farther away. This seems like too much of a pattern to be a coincidence. It's as though the planets were somehow sorted. And again, there's no law of physics that says a gas giant would be destroyed if it were in the same orbit as the Earth. Nothing, nothing terribly bad would happen. So the fact that the gas giants are all far from the sun, again, seems to be a clue about where the solar system and by extension, where all planets come from. By the way, you probably noticed Pluto obeys none of these patterns. Its orbit is not especially close to circular. It's not aligned with the other planets. And it is a rocky, solid body, even though it is very far from the sun. So what do we do? Well, we're scientists. We know exactly what to do. We simply redefine the word planet so that Pluto no longer qualifies. And now we have a solar system with no exceptions. Of course, the story is more interesting than that. There are valid reasons to have made that redefinition besides the desire for a, a tidy definition, but that's, a, that's another story. Getting back to these expectations. So this is what pre-exoplanet astronomers had access to, these three patterns. And for decades, even centuries, a theory arose to try and explain these patterns, the theory of planet formation. It's a very complicated and beautiful theory that does successfully explain these three patterns. However, one of the fun things about this field is that we have found exoplanets and exoplanetary systems that violate each of these three patterns. So there was something missing or maybe even something fundamentally wrong with the theory of planet formation. And given our limited time, I won't even endeavor to explain it. All that you need to know is that this theory was deeply entrenched in the minds of astronomers and set all of our expectations for what exoplanets would be like. They would have circular orbits aligned with each other, with the rocky planets on the inside and the gas giants on the outside. Now, the, the test of any theory is whether it makes correct predictions. So that was, that's one of the main reasons why we like to study exoplanets, is to try and figure out the correct theory of planet formation. The problem, though, is that exoplanets are, to put it mildly, very difficult to detect. They don't emit much light of their own, and they are much smaller than the stars that they orbit. So it's often compared to the problem of trying to see a firefly, and someone is shining a searchlight right in your face. The glare of the star is overwhelming and makes it very difficult to detect the planets going around it. So the first thing you might think of doing if you are asked to find an exoplanet is to get your hands on one of the world's best telescopes, point it at some nearby star, and take a picture. And what you might hope to see is the star at the center of the picture, and then a few fainter dots surrounding the star that would represent the planets. However, when you actually try to do this, you get an image more like this. This looks like an object surrounded by rings with spikes coming out of it. But all, of, all of those are artifacts. Those are optical artifacts. They're not really out there in space. What's really out there should be a star whose light is confined to just one pixel in the image. 
But because of all sorts of practical problems, the starlight spills over many pixels in the detector, thereby spoiling our view of the much fainter dots, the planets that might be underneath. So this, this so-called direct imaging method of just taking a picture and looking for planets is very difficult bordering on impossible with current technology. It's not totally impossible. And there are a few dozen special planetary systems that have been directly imaged in this way. But that's only a few dozen out of the 5,500 known exoplanets. Most of our knowledge about exoplanets comes from other methods, more indirect methods, sneakier methods that rely on our knowledge of physics and our ability to measure the properties of starlight with extreme precision. So I wanna talk about two of those methods, the two methods that have resulted in by far the largest numbers of known exoplanets. The first one is based on the fact that when we teach our students the planets go around the, the sun, that's not exactly true. What's really happening is that the planets and the sun are both, are all going around the center of mass of the solar system. So here, if you have just one star and one planet and you set them moving, what you see is the planet is indeed going around the star, but the star is circling around too. It's being pulled by the planet. Right? Newton's third law, if the planet is pulling on the star, if the star is pulling on the planet, the planet must also be pulling back on the star. Now that doesn't cause the star to move very much because the star is so massive, but it does move. And that gives us our way in because we have very powerful ways these days of detecting the motions of stars. And one of those methods is based on the Doppler effect. Probably most of you have heard that term, the Doppler effect, but if you need a reminder, and I hope the sound comes through here, this is the Doppler effect. You get the Doppler effect whenever you have a moving source of waves, like a car with its horn going on. If the car were sitting still, the horn would be emitting sound waves, and those waves would have a characteristic wavelength, a distance between the peaks of the wave. But if the car is moving, and we're viewing it from the forward direction, if it's coming at us, the car is catching up with its own previously emitted waves. And so the wavelength is compressed to a smaller value. And for sound, a shorter wavelength means a higher pitch. Whereas if we are behind the car, the car is moving away from its own previously emitted waves, thereby stretching the wavelength, which means a lower pitch. And that's why the car horn goes from to as it speeds past. Same thing happens for any kind of waves, and light is a type of wave. So if you have a moving star, and we are viewing that star from this direction, so it's coming towards us, the light waves emitted by the star will be observed with a shorter wavelength. And for light, that means a bluer color. It means that the spectrum of the star is shifted to the blue end. Whereas if we are over here watching the star go away, the light is red shifted. Now, this occurs for any moving source of light. But when we see a car at night and its headlights are coming towards us, we don't notice them being slightly bluer as it heads towards us and redder as it goes away from us. That would be really cool to have some special glasses that allow you to perceive those tiny Doppler effects. It requires specialized equipment, but that's our job as astronomers is to build ever more precise machines for characterizing the light from distant stars in this case. So that's our way in. We can detect the motion of the star around the center of mass of the planetary system by monitoring the star's Doppler shift. Now, what really helps is another amazing property about starlight. And that is, if you do take a prism and you send, say, sunlight through it and spread it out into this beautiful rainbow, you see the rainbow from all the way from the blue end to the red end. But then if you look more carefully, you see that certain colors appear to be darker than others. There are, there are colors that seem to be missing, that, that show up as dark vertical lines in this spectrum. Very specific colors. And that is because of the elements that are in the outer atmosphere of the sun. Each element of the periodic table has its 
favorite colors that it absorbs and emits more than any other. So for example, sodium atoms happen to be fond of these two particular shades of kind of yellow orange. And so if there's sodium atoms in the outer atmosphere of the sun, the light coming from deep within the sun passes through those, that atmosphere and the sodium subtracts light at these very specific wavelengths, these specific colors. What's useful about this, first of all, that's just fascinating. It allows us to learn what the sun is made of, but it's also useful for detecting exoplanets because these are nice sharp features, these lines that we can track very precisely to see if their wavelengths are changing. So what's happening, we can't see it, but the star and the planet are both going around the center of mass, but we can see the shifts in these so-called spectral absorption lines, these dark lines moving back and forth from which we can infer that the star is alternately moving away from us and then towards us and then away from us again because it is circling around the center of mass. So that is the game. That is the Doppler method for finding exoplanets. Now, let me show you an example. If you've ever had the treat of uh, being under a dark sky in the Southern Hemisphere, then you might have seen a view like this one. So this is the famous Southern Cross. We have the constellation of Centaurus that kind of surrounds it. And over here is a very famous pair of stars actually called Alpha Centauri that are often said to be the closest stars to the sun. Actually, that's not exactly right. There is a much less conspicuous star over here, a little red star that you actually can't see by eye. You need at least a good pair of binoculars to see it. It's called Proxima Centauri. And it is just a hair closer to us than the two stars of Alpha Centauri. Anyways, in 2016, it was announced a group of astronomers found an exoplanet with the Doppler method around Proxima Centauri, our nearest neighbor in the galaxy. And what was even more exciting is this new planet, which has been called, without that much creativity, Proxima B. The new planet is in the so-called habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. That's the range of distances where an Earth-like planet would be able, would have a surface temperature allowing for liquid water. That is the surface temperature would be between zero and hundred degrees Celsius. The reason we call that habitable or potentially habitable is because we think, I mean, we don't, we don't know a lot about how life got started on the earth, but it probably had something to do with the oceans. Like a lot of people think that life on earth required liquid water oceans to get started, life as we know it anyways. And so when we are looking around the galaxy for signs of life, maybe we should prioritize the planets where there might also be liquid water oceans, where you might be able to go for a swim is one way to think of it. So that's very exciting. The very nearest star to ours in the galaxy has a planet and it's not much larger than the earth. So it's a plausibly earth-like planet within the star's habitable zone. Very exciting. This was front page news at the time. And if you were following the news, it was probably accompanied by this dramatic image right from the planet's surface, right? We see these mountains, uh, we see Proxima Centauri in the distance. You can even see the two stars of Alpha Centauri further away. There seems to be some kind of mist rising from the valley. Of course, this is a complete fantasy. We have no idea what it looks like on the surface of this planet. Our information about exoplanets is very limited. In fact, everything we knew about the planet at that time is in this chart. This is really what we know about Proxima Centauri. Each data point here shows the apparent speed of the star measured through the Doppler shift as a function of time over the course of, of a couple of years. So these red and blue data points show that Overall, the star does seem to be going alternately away from us and towards us. You always wish the data were better, right? The, the pattern doesn't leap off of the page, but it is a statistically significant signal. And from the amplitude of that signal, that tells us about the mass of the planet. The more mass of the planet, the more it pulls the star around. And from how long it takes the signal to repeat, that tells us how long it takes for the planet to go all the way around the star. So those are the two most basic things we learn about a planet from the Doppler method. Now, let me show you another famous discovery from the Doppler method. This is a star called 51 Pegasi. It is a sun-like star. I think it's about 50 light years away. 
And it was announced in 1995 that an exoplanet was orbiting this star. And it wasn't exactly the first exoplanet discovery. As I described in my book, the history of this field is kind of complicated, but it was the discovery that really launched a thousand ships, that really got this field going and marked the beginning of the phase of exponential growth that we are in today. So what is interesting about this is not only that it's an exoplanet, but the amplitude of the signal here is larger than it was before. So here it's 70 meters per second. That indicates we're dealing with a giant planet comparable to Jupiter, say. But what was shocking is the period, how long it takes to go around. It's only about four days. That is, the planet goes all the way around its orbit every four days. Jupiter takes 12 years to go around. And we thought that all giant planets would be far away from their stars and take decades or, or so to go around. Even Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, takes 88 days to go around. So the, this very first important discovery completely contradicted the theory of planet formation right off the bat. So if our solar system had a planet just like the one around 51 Pegasi, where would we put it on, on this map of the solar system? Well, we, we couldn't put it on this diagram. We have to zoom way in here to the inner solar system. Okay, so now we're looking at Mercury, and Venus, Earth, and Mars. And the planet around 51 Pegasi would be something like this, just hugging the sun. Now, this is a newly discovered category of planets that has been called, again, without that much creativity, hot Jupiters. They are presumably giant planets, mostly gaseous, like Saturn and Jupiter, but they are much closer to their stars than any of the planets is to the sun. And figuring out where they came from and where our theory of planet formation went wrong is one of the current puzzles in exoplanetary science. Okay, let me show you another uh, surprising discovery from early in this field. This is again a chart showing the speed of a star either away from us or towards us using the Doppler effect. In this case, it's over about 200 days. And this star was doing something much stranger. It was moving away from us at 600 meters per second. And it started decelerating and slowing down. And then it started coming towards us faster and faster. But then on this one day here, like at day number 110 or so, it suddenly put on the accelerator and jerked at very high speed away from us again before repeating this whole pattern. So what is going on here? Why is this star behaving in such a strange way? The answer is that it's an exoplanet pulling the star around. But the orbit of that planet is not even close to being a circular, a circle. It is a highly elongated ellipse with the star very close to one end of the ellipse. And every time the planet comes close to the star, that's when the gravitational force is the strongest, when the two objects are closest together, causing the planet to speed up. And the star speeds up in response. And that's what produces this big spike of acceleration that we saw in the chart. So that was the second major surprise. The orbits do not have to be nearly circular. Many times we do find them to be circular, but there are lots of exceptions of which this one is my, my favorite. This is a star called HD 80606. So there's so many of these that we cannot assign creative names to all of them. So many times they're just some catalog number. Now, that was the first method I wanted to introduce to you, the Doppler method. And that's responsible for about 500 of the known exoplanets. Most of the rest of the 5,500, that is about another 4,000 or so, come from the second method that I want to describe. And that's based on eclipses. So you've all heard of eclipses, eclipses of the sun or lunar eclipses. There is another kind of eclipse that we can see in the solar system that's, that's much more subtle. Uh, this is a movie of the sun that was made on June 6, 2012. And hopefully you can see on your screen this tiny little black dot moving across the face of the sun. That was Venus making one of its rare passages directly in front of the sun. Next time this is going to happen is going to be the year 2117. So if you missed it, I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait a long time to see it again. The point is that this kind of thing must happen for exoplanets around other stars too. And so even if this were some very distant star, so far away that it only looks like a point of light in the sky, we might be able to tell that it's happening 
because when the planet goes in front of it, the star appears to get slightly fainter. The planet blocks a small fraction of the starlight. Now in astronomy, an eclipse where the body in front is really small compared to the body in back is called a transit, like the transit of Venus. And the, the planet is transiting across the face of the star. So this method is usually called the transit method. And it is very much the here and now of exoplanetary science. That NASA mission that Zara alluded to that I've been part of is all about finding transiting planets around the nearest and brightest stars in the galaxy. So here's some real data. This is the data that was used to detect a particular exoplanet called WASP-12, another one of my favorites. What we're looking at now is not speed, but instead brightness of the star as a function of time. And every day or so, this particular star drops from its usual brightness by about one and a half percent. And that is because there is a giant planet, a Jupiter-sized planet, whose orbit carries it directly in front of that star from our particular point of view in the galaxy. And then it repeats every day. So in this case, what we get to measure, we get to measure the period again from the time it takes between these events. And from the amount of light that's blocked, we can measure the size or the diameter of the planet because that's what determines how much light is blocked. So this is another hot Jupiter. A very important discovery that was made with transits is shown on this chart. This is an object called Kepler 11. Now, at first glance, it looks kind of like the other one. We see there's a bunch of static, and that's just our measurement uncertainty. But then you see these dips here. Doo, doo, doo. The, the weird thing is they don't look periodic. They don't look like they recur at regular intervals. They seem kind of erratic, and it doesn't always go down by the same amount. So what is going on here? Why does this one look so different? It's because Kepler-11 has six planets that are all transiting. And they're all crammed in these tiny little orbits, each of which comes around on its own schedule. So what we were looking at there is the sum of six different periodic transit signals. That's why it was so confusing. Now, the reason why I think this is an especially important discovery is that these kind of miniature solar systems like Kepler-11 turn out to be very common. If you pick a random star like the sun, there is a chance, something like one in three, that it has one of these, where all the planet's orbits are crammed into what would be Venus's orbit around that same star. So our theory of planet formation didn't exactly exclude the possibility of miniature solar systems, but it didn't predict them either. And so discovering that there's this whole new category of very common planetary systems that had no place in our previous theories is also very exciting and hopefully will be very uh, informative to help us devise a better theory. Okay, now let me show you, I promised I would show you some sci-fi worlds. Okay, so let's get to that. This is an object called Kepler 78. So again, this is a transit discovery. So we're looking at brightness versus time. And I want to impress upon you the numbers here on the vertical axis. These are very tiny changes in brightness that we are now capable of measuring. So this particular star got fainter, you know, a few numbers in the fourth decimal place, the brightness went down by just this tiny little amount. That tells us we're dealing with a roughly Earth-sized planet. And it repeats, it looks like every 10 units or so. And when you look at what the units are, it's surprising. These are hours. These are not days or months or years. This is a planet that is going around its star roughly every, I think it's about eight and a quarter hours. So the, the time it takes to get a good night's sleep, this planet has gone all the way around this, its star. It is, it is almost as close as it is physically possible to be to the star without being destroyed. Now, some of you might have also noticed there's a second dip here. It doesn't look so prominent, but it looks like in between these transits, there's another dip in brightness. What, what, is, what is going on there? What's going on there is wonderful. So we can't see this, but here's what we're supposed to imagine. Planet is going in front of the star, and I'll try to stop the movie here. So when the planet is in front of the star, that's when we see this big dip. But then afterwards, the planet continues on its merry way around the star. And at this point, we can see the planet's hot, illuminated day side, which contributes to the total light that enters our telescope. 
But what happens is when the planet goes behind the star, we lose that light. That is the second dip here. And what's exciting about that is by measuring the size of this dip, we can tell how much light the planet is emitting. And that tells us what the temperature of the planet is. The hotter it is, the more it will be glowing. And in this case, we can conclude that the planet's surface temperature is heated to over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. What that means is that on the side of the planet facing the star, it's so hot that it is surely above the melting point of any common minerals that, that we know of. So when we give that information to our friends, the space artists, we know the size of the planet, we have the mass of the planet, and now we know the surface temperature of the planet. This is what they invite us to imagine. These types of planets have been called lava worlds because it stands to reason, there's very good reason to think that the side of the planet facing the star is covered with an ocean of lava and is in permanent, uh, extremely hot conditions. So that's the Mustafar-like planet from, uh, from that third Star Wars movie. Now here's another one. Again, we're looking at brightness versus time. In this case, it's over about a month. And we see here these, these sharp dips and there's two different kinds and they alternate. And these dips, in these, during these dips, the brightness of the star goes down by more than 15%, in this case, 20%. That's way too big to be a planet. A planet would not produce a brightness dip this big. But then if you look carefully over here and the lower panel zooms in so we can get a better look, there is a little planet-sized dip here. So what is going on here? Well, again, what's going on is amazing. What we have here is a pair of stars orbiting their common center of mass, and we are viewing it from the side. So the stars eclipse each other. The red star goes in front of the yellow star, and then the yellow star goes in front of the red star. That explains those sharp, deep eclipses. But then in addition, there is a planet whose orbit I'm trying to follow with my cursor, whose orbit loops around both stars. And every time it comes around, it transits the yellow star, and it transits the red star. And so now, by, but at this point, we have four or five years worth of data, and there's no question that that's what's going on. All of the data fit this premise, that the planet has two stars in the sky. So this is a so-called circumbinary planet, a planet uh, whose orbit surrounds a pair of stars rather than a single star. I played a small role in discovering this planet with a, a previous space telescope called the Kepler telescope. And so I can tell you uh, for sure that the, the science team that was involved in the discovery, we were excited about uh, testing the theory of planet formation because that theory, uh, some variants of that theory predicted that such planets should be impossible, that the constantly shifting gravity of the moving stars would stir up the material too much and prevent it from forming planets. But we were at least as excited about confirming George Lucas, you know, and finding a planet that many of us grew up with in our imaginations. Okay, now, um, let me show you something else you, amazing you can do with transits. We, we, I've explained how we measure the mass of a planet, size of a planet, the temperature of a planet, but we can go further. We can even measure a few of the molecules in the planet's atmosphere. And that again relies on this amazing property of starlight, that there are these missing colors, these absorption lines, and the particular wavelengths that are missing tell us which elements are doing the absorbing by comparison with laboratory experiments with those same elements. So what that means is that if we are viewing a transit, so this planet is going in front of a star and it's blocking a certain part of the light, well, the planet does have an atmosphere. And in the outer part of the atmosphere, it's only partially opaque. That is, it's a little bit translucent. So some of the starlight filters through the outer atmosphere on its way to us. And if we observe this transit at lots of different wavelengths, like imagine we had some glasses that allowed us to view this scene only at the very specific wavelength of 0.589 microns. That's where sodium does its absorbing. And if there is sodium in the atmosphere, the planet would suddenly look bigger. Its atmosphere would go dark because the sodium is blocking that particular type of light. So that's the game here. We perform these transit observations but we do it at hundreds or thousands of different wavelengths. And by doing so, 
we can learn the constituents of the planet's atmosphere. And many of you have heard of NASA's newest space telescope. It was launched about a year and a half ago, and it's been operating for about a year. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's much bigger and better than our previous favorite telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, in most respects. And it's especially good at the experiment I just described of performing so-called transit spectroscopy to try to sniff out the molecules in the atmospheres of exoplanets. So here's some real data from the Webb telescope that was uh, released to the public uh, a couple of months ago. We're looking at a hot Jupiter, happens to be called WASP-39, and during the transit, as expected, the star gets fainter, in this case by a little more than 2%. But this was what was observed at a kind of arbitrary wavelength of 3.8 micrometers or microns. If you observe it at 4.3 microns, those are the orange dots, it goes deeper, the star gets fainter. And that's because the planet in front of it evidently has carbon dioxide in its atmosphere and carbon dioxide absorbs strongly at 4.3 microns. Josh, can I chime in with a question? Because I have oh, been please. intrigued by something you have said a couple of times here. You dip between calling these planets planets and exoplanets. Right. I can't help but notice it throughout your talk. And actually, it's reminding me of something that you say at one point about how we call any planets that belong to a star other than our own sun exoplanets. That's right. Yeah. But this might be a slightly bizarre way of thinking about it because actually, Planets that belong to our star are in the like minute minority, right? If I'm correct in thinking, right? So it's kind yes. of funny that we call all other planets something different, but our own um, planets are the only ones that are actually called planets. So I'm wondering if your book should have actually been called The Little Book of Planets by your yeah. own theory, right? Um, yes. And you move between it throughout the talk. What's your personal take on this uh, terminological distinction between planets versus exoplanets? Yes, yeah, sorry, you're absolutely right that when there were only a dozen or so known exoplanets, it made sense to emphasize the exo nature of those planets right. because there was a new exciting field. We need to distinguish them from the planets in the solar system. But you know, there are only eight planets and there are, well, there's something like a hundred billion stars in the galaxy and most of them probably had planets. Right. So it does seem a little silly. Um, and most of the time, like these days, I, I often do just refer to them as planets and only add the exo when I really need to make that distinction. So I'm curious uh, because, you know, you're talking us through the Doppler method and uh, the transit method as ways to detect these planets, as, as we will now call them. We will try and be the change that we hope to see in the terminology, right? right? <laughs> um, I, I'm curious, like you, you talk and obviously are incredibly fluent in the, the ways in which we can use these methods um, to discover things about planets. Um, do you have a favorite sort of story about a discovery that was made. Um, like for instance, I'm, I always remember this one This one part in the book where you talk about a startlingly easy moment in the mm -hmm. in the discovery of planets. I think it was when you were talking about hot Jupiters. That's right. You'll say, if you'll amuse me to just talk from the book for a moment, you say, oh, I've been moaning and groaning about how hard it is to detect exoplanets. I'd like to end on a different note. Despite the technological challenges and despite all the false starts, the discovery of exoplanets was a rare and wonderful occasion when a scientific endeavor turned out to be easier than expected. That's right. So yeah, what have been some moments in using these methods to detect planets that have surprised or interested you personally more right. so than anything else? So you're absolutely right. Nature was very kind to us in that if all other planetary systems did resemble the solar system, we would really struggle even with today's technology to detect any of them. Uh, the, are these methods, the transit method, the Doppler method, they work better when either the planet is really big or when it's really close to the star. But in our solar system, you know, Mercury is too small. We can't detect it around a distant star. And the giant planets are too far out. So nature was very kind to us in accelerating the development of this field by serving up these really big, close orbiting planets, which are both intrinsically interesting and also much easier to detect. Now, my own yeah, personal definitely. obsessions mostly have to do with geometry. I'm, I'm fascinated yeah. by the shapes of their orbits, the spacings between orbits. And one of the discoveries I like the best relates to the rotation of the star. So in the solar system, not only do all the planets revolve the same way, 
But the sun is spinning the same way too. The sun spins around about once a month and its equator lines up with the rest of the solar system. And that kind of makes sense, you know, how, why would it be any other way? And that's what everybody expected. But starting around 2008, 2009, our group and, and others started finding dramatic uh, exceptions, the stars whose, or, whose rotations tilted by 60 degrees compared to the others. And, and even some wonderful cases where the star is rotating this way and the planets are going in the exact opposite direction. <laughs> So trying to figure out what happened there uh, is, again, uh, part of what animates me and my research group was to find, um, I, I really like the long-term goal of finding other Earth-like planets. But I also like finding really strange, exceptional cases because they're often uh, the most revealing. Mm, that's a really interesting point because I think we can get really caught up from, let's call it the audience perspective, those who are not actively involved in the field of astrophysics ourselves. And we we watch all of these developments as a captivated audience. But I feel like we often get distracted or at least hyper focused on this question of extraterrestrial life, right, or planets very similar to Earth. And we forget that there can be fascinating things about the solar system and other solar systems, not because we're finding things like our version of life, right. but because we're finding things far different. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I agree. We're very lucky in this field because the search for life is one of the most uh, kind of amazing quests that humanity can go on. I think everybody yeah. would agree that the discovery of life elsewhere is very important. And surely a part of that is finding the planets, right? It might be a while before we actually know whether any of them is inhabited, but at least we're making progress on that long-term quest. And along the way, there are all of these other weird, fascinating, unexpected types of planets that we can explore. Yeah, absolutely. And Something you alluded to there, this idea of the quest for whether it's other fascinating planets totally unlike our own or extraterrestrial life or planets similar to our own in whatever form they may be. All of these things are quests that may outlast you or I or indeed anyone alive today, right? They are missions that may very well stretch beyond our collective lifespans. That's right. As someone working in a field that is that huge, and I, I think, you know, I have colleagues in tech and I'm sure anyone working in a scientific field can relate to this phenomenon to a degree, right? The idea of trying to march ceaselessly towards a discovery or a milestone that you know may elude you in your yeah. personal life. How do you get up on a Monday, Josh? Like what yeah, motivates you to keep keep showing up and doing the work when you may never like, so if there's a finish line to cross, it may never be crossed within our lifespans. That's true, it's true. I mean, uh, the quest to find extraterrestrial life has is, uh, we have no idea how long it's gonna take. It could be years, decades, centuries, millennia. Uh, you know, some of, some of the people in my field call it the holy grail of exoplanetary science, this mm. idea of trying to find conclusive life, evidence for life. That kind of worries me because in the stories, I don't think King Arthur ever found the holy grail. Right? <laughs> so we don't want to be in that situation. But again, it's such a compelling quest. And what, what helps me get up in the morning and keep going is the immediate discoveries are very interesting and this field is very technology driven. It's mm -hmm. not a field that is pure theory and devoid of experimental confirmations. Every time someone figures out how to make a camera that can make more precise brightness measurements or record the spectrum of a star with greater precision, we find more things. It's not just exoplanets, all of astrophysics is like that. And we know that there are so many reasons why our technology is going to improve independently of what astronomers want. And so we're basically guaranteed uh, in this, you know, based on past experience at least, to keep this, this era of discovery going for a long time. And Absolutely. keep squeezing more and more information out of these trickles of starlight that, that come our way. I mean, it's a beautiful way of putting it. And for an infinite world out there, there are infinite final juices to be squeezed, right? Yeah. Um, unfortunately for us, our, our talk cannot be infinite. So I'm gonna go, go on to my final question, Josh. Sure. Um, you've talked a lot about the role of technology um, in this discipline and in the nature of constant change. Right? This is not a field defined by landing on certainty. It is a field that has to be humble enough um, to breach new grounds, to question old um, certainties. What is a question that persists in the astrophysical field today that you hope we might get an answer to? 
in the next X amount of time? You can pick a time slot, the next yeah. five years, the next 10 years, the next 20. What is an an question you hope we yeah. might have an answer to? So I don't know if we will find another Earth with living creatures on it, but it does seem like a very good bet that we will find truly, we will be able, we will be capable of detecting truly Earth-like planets within our lifetimes, right? At the moment, if we were 20 light years away, looking back at the solar system with the technology we have today, we would not be able to detect the Earth. At least we would not be very confident in any detection of the Earth. It's too far away from the sun, it's too small. However, we're only about one order of magnitude away, okay? So that is, our technology has improved by many orders of magnitude over the last <laughs> 50 years. One more order of magnitude and precision, and we'll be able to detect a truly Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. And it's such a compelling goal that there are many people working hard at it. So every 10 years in our field, uh, NASA and the National Science Foundation convene a kind of blue ribbon panel to decide what should be the top level priorities for the next 10 years in astrophysics. And that just happened about a year ago. And the top level priority is the one I just described. It is to find, uh, to be capable of finding truly Earth-like planets in all the respects we can measure around nearby stars and to perfect that method that I began with, the direct imaging method, to be able to see an image where you see a star and you also see a so-called pale blue dot, which would be an Earth-like planet orbiting that star. So that I think is, is well within our reach. Um, whether we can find, figure out whether there are creatures on that planet, that's a step uh, that will, uh, people are certainly working on that, but we're gonna need some fresh ideas and we're gonna need some more luck. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there are not only astrophysicists working on that, but fan yes. fiction writers abound. Yeah, totally. um, Josh, it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you today about some of the, quite truly the biggest questions facing our species, um, our version of life as we know it. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here at Talks at Google. Um, I wish you and all of Google wishes you continued prosperity and good fortune in the search to answer these questions that you have shared with us. Um, I can promise you we'll all be sitting with bated breath uh, for you know, the next exciting milestone that we cross in this field. Um, Thank you so much for your time today. Anyone joining um, and listening to us live and anyone watching this back retrospectively, thank you for your time um, listening to our conversation. I would strongly recommend if you have been at all fascinated by any of the really compelling stuff that Josh has talked to us about today, go and grab your own copy of the little book of exoplanets or the little book of planets as we're secretly gonna call it now. Um, you can find uh, a link to go do so in the notes at the bottom of this video. Josh. Have a fantastic rest of your day um, and good luck with everything Thank in the future. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Bye. Bye everyone.